Hello and welcome to this Web Extra edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. I'm delighted to be joined by legendary value investor Bill Miller, Chairman and Chief Investment Officer of Miller Value Partners, an independent investment advisory firm that he launched in 2016 after acquiring his money management firm from his longtime employer, Leg Mason. Now, Bill, of course, is the only mutual fund manager to have beaten the S&P 500 for 15 years running. He did that from 1999 to 2005. And one of his two major current funds, the Miller Opportunity Trust, which he launched in 1999, was the number one ranked U.S. stock mutual fund in the five years ending 2016. He also runs a hedge fund, which is why I'm talking to him today, MVP One Hedge Fund, which was an early investor in Bitcoin. And Bill, I've known you for a long time. You never cease to surprise me um, in what you own. And I'm trying to reconcile you as a value investor and a Bitcoin investor. So um, for the record, when did you start buying Bitcoin? And what's your average price? Uh, I I started buying in 2014, maybe 2015. Um, Several years ago. Several years ago, yeah. And and my average cost is around $350. And I've paid below 200 for some and paid above 500 for others but the average is around 350 what attracted you to bitcoin uh in the beginning and, and especially again I'm considering you as a value investor well you know it's it's funny consuelo I'll, I'll answer that directly but I'll go back and and just just um recall the fact that when I was buying uh amazon stock at a fraction of today's price back in the back uh, after it came public I think on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, my friend Harvey Eisen said, I must have been drunk when I thought that Amazon was a value. And, um, and the, same with, the same with Google. I actually have a, I actually have a, a presentation that I gave where I, where I toted up all the things that people were saying about Google when it came public, most of which were that it, was, um, uh, that it shouldn't be bought, that it, uh, that it was just a commodity item. It was technologically going to be superseded, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think one of the things that, that we've tried to do in our, in our shop is try and have an open mind, about, especially about new technologies and new ways of doing things. Most of them don't work, and so they're, from a probabilistic standpoint, um, you, you have to kind of believe that when you're looking at those sorts of things, A, you have a high probability of being wrong, and B, um, even if you, if, if you have confidence in it, it it's likely not going to work. So it's really a question of assessing risk and reward on an individual case-by-case basis. So with Bitcoin, um, I was probably aware of it. Well, I certainly was aware of it before I started buying it, um, but didn't really take it too seriously. Just thought it was an interesting, um, uh, an interesting experiment, which in many ways it, it, it still is, although it's a much different experiment right now than it was, you know, when it traded at, a, at you know, it was ten cents, I think, in two thousand and two thousand and ten. Um, but what what attracted me to it was I, re- I read a book by Nathaniel Popper called Digital Gold, which is a history of the, the kind of the Bitcoin phenomenon, and, and had, it had like many histories for new things, a very colorful colorful history. But it was it was interesting to me that the people that I had a high regard for in the venture capital world uh, took it very seriously. And uh, so, so, for example, people like Mark Andreessen, Fred Wilson, New York Venture. Uh, and and so that that caught my attention, and I decided to do a lot more work on it. And as I did the work on it, it became clear to me that, um, in fact, it, I got I got interested enough in it that at the uh, Santa Fe Institute, whereas I think you know I was chairman for many years and on the board for for, for 25 years, I actually I actually funded a, a workshop called Money Past, Present, and Future, which we had archaeologists, sociologists, tech, uh, technologists, cryptographers. All kinds of uh, obviously economists, monetary economists, and the, the whole the, the topic was uh, money, past, present, and future. So uh, trying to look at really uh, how money arose, what what its history has been, how it's been used, what types of things have counted as money, and um, I think it was after that after that conference that I finally uh, figured out Bitcoin, at least to the, my satisfaction in terms of beginning to uh, beginning to invest in it. And, um, so what and, what did you learn, Bill? At I mean, at that conference, money, past, present, and future, that convinced you that that Bitcoin had a future. First of all, it had already it had it had passed through its I'd say uh, stages of of greatest risk. So when it came out, I mean, it came out at, at you know at pennies, and I and and then it was probably trading. Well, I want to say it might have been trading somewhere in the you know four or five hundred dollar range at that point in time. Um, so it had risen quite remarkably, and that 
you know that that in itself caught my attention. That something which was so a controversial and 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 b um, difficult to wrap one's arms around, at least initially, could have gone up that much, could have attracted that much attention, and especially as I said, the, the venture capital folks who um, who I began to pay attention to on it. And I guess the thing that struck me on it was well, twofold. Number one, there really hasn't been any technological innovation in in money uh, ever. And so uh, you know, we've we've had stages along the way where you went from you know money being a, a you know in various societies around the world everything from everything from rocks to ju- to you know to jewels to gold and silver, um, but but by and large money was a tangible thing. And then then governments began issuing you know fiat currencies, but they were always backed by by something tangible. And and uh, and then Bitcoin, of course, is 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 very very different because it's a uh, it's it's a technological innovation. It's really just a piece of software, and it's a technological innovation that that uh, is uncorrelated as a potential asset with anything else. So it doesn't really matter what the Fed's doing. It doesn't matter what a government is doing. It doesn't matter what's going on politically or or, or uh, geopolitically. Uh, Bitcoin's uh, value is going to be set by people in a in a free and open market who are who decide what it's worth. So, um, and that's that's a very interesting innovation. And there's a there's a book by the philosopher John Searle called "The Social Construction of Reality," where he deals with this kind of this kind of thing. Like, where do these things come from? Like, where does marriage come from? For example, it's it's not something that exists out in the world. We made it up on our own, and it's a very powerful institution. And and Bitcoin, I think, when I began to get into it, it struck me that the you know the you know still unknown creator of the of the white paper that led to Bitcoin, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, who may be one person or who may be a, you know, a, a group of people, but he referred in the white paper, I think, to, to Bitcoin as digital gold about six or seven times. And, and so in, in thinking about that, uh, you know, gold is something that, it's, as people say, it's an asset that's no one else's liability. And, the, and so governments don't control it. And uh, it trades freely. But, it, but it's the kind of thing that has a lot of problems with respect to uh, functioning uh, as a currency, for example, it's, that is to say, it's it's hard to transport. Just for one thing, it's not infinite, infinitely divisible in any reasonable way. And Bitcoin solves all of those problems. And so, when I at, at the conference that I mentioned, um, I, I'd say the thing that that kind of pushed me over the edge was there's a one of the more thoughtful people in the who, who presented there was a guy named Wences Casares, who was the CEO and founder of a firm called uh, Zappo X A P O, which is a digital while a digital holder for uh, you know, for Bitcoin and a custodian. And one of the things that he said was, he said, uh, you know, Bitcoin might not have any evident value. Uh, it may be a tough thing to understand if you live in the United States. He said, but I'm from Argentina. And he said, my family's been in Argentina over 100 years. And he said, and the government has uh, t- uh, taken all of our money away and, and bankrupted us three separate times over that time, seizing, seizing bank deposits, um, uh, inflating us uh, uh, twice out of the... You know, out of uh, existence in terms of uh, that, and he said so. So Bitcoin is a way around that. Uh, governments can't control it; they can't seize it. Uh, it can be tra- it can be sent instantaneously. And and again, at the time, Bitcoin um, we, you know was getting some attention. And uh, and one of the things that that once has said that I think probably kicked me over the edge on it was he said he said, look, the stupidest thing anybody could ever do would be to put more money in Bitcoin than they could afford to lose 100 percent of. He said, because okay. there's a non-trivial chance that it goes to zero. And he said, the second stupidest thing you could ever do is own no Bitcoin whatsoever. He said, because there's also a non-trivial chance that at the time was, you know, in the hundreds, he said, it can go to 1,000, it can go to 5,000, 10,000, 50,000, 100,000, even a million dollars per Bitcoin. And and so he, he said, my advice to people that are interested is, he said, put 1% of your liquid net worth in Bitcoin. He said, you can afford to lose 1%. I mean, you know, stock market will go down 1% in a day. And he said, and then forget about it and do not trade it and do not do anything with it. And it'll be worth zero or it'll be worth a lot. And that I found that an interesting proposition, especially in light of what the venture capital money that was going into it. And so that's what, you know, that's what started me. And my son also bought, you know, a reasonable amount uh, uh, at, at the time as well. Does it trade freely? I mean, it just, it oh, seems sure. that it's. Okay. But I mean, it's, it's, uh, you know, so you tell me, I mean, how liquid is it? How easy is it to buy? And I, I know, I know you, you know, you well, told me. It's cumbersome to buy. Um, it's right. much easier today now, now that Bitcoin futures launched yesterday. And that right. I think is also part of the path 
to um, uh, to Bitcoin respectability, which is you you now have you know the CBOE and the CME uh, uh, CBOE started yesterday and CME is going to start soon trading Bitcoin futures, you know cash settled the cash settled futures margin requirements are reasonably stiff at around thirty percent, but but it eliminates the uh, the big problem with Bitcoin, which is you have to store it somewhere before futures uh, start trading started. And that requires a public key and a private key, and it requires paying storage costs just like you would with just like you would with gold. Totally. And also, if it's if if one of the places where you have it stored, especially if the Bitcoin exchange gets hacked and you lose your Bitcoin, yeah. you can't recover it. So it's it's right. gone it's gone forever. So that's that's a that's a downside. With with futures, that you, you eliminate that problem, right? Because it's you know it's going to be it's going to be settled in a in a in a, in a market. And it's, it can't be stolen. That's the first step towards respectability. The next one will be Bitcoin ETFs, which which will require you know SEC approval. They turned it down uh, about two years ago, I guess it was, and said there was there was insufficient uh, safeguards and regulatory apparatus around it. But those will come, uh, I would guess, probably in the next year or two, especially as these futures get get going. Um, the, one of the things that kicked off the big move in Bitcoin this year was when Japan. In February, announced that Bitcoin would be legal tender in Japan, and they put out licensing requirements for exchanges to make them, you know, fully regulated. And that that sent that sent that was a, a very important point in uh, in time, and that sent Bitcoin up uh, considerably. And now I think that's now what we're seeing with the rise in price is is people looking at this thing and saying, well, you know, if it's if it's there's about seven and a half trillion dollars of value in gold held today around the you know, around the world. And Bitcoin's market cap right now is around $290 billion. Mm-hmm. So if, if if Bitcoin just got to be 10% of gold, that would be $800 billion. And, you know, that would be what almost three times your money from here, two and a half times your money from here. And again, that's just, that's just one measure of what it, you know, of what Bitcoin can, uh, can do, because it, it, it also is a threat. There's a very interesting paper that Susan Athey at Stanford wrote several years ago, on Bitcoin, where and this is when Bitcoin was, I'd say, mostly the um, territory of, uh, I'd say, the anti-Fed people, anti-government libertarians, and mm-hmm. uh, who, who liked it because it, it w- wasn't uh, under any kind of government uh, control. And they were talking about, you know, the, 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 I'd say the ideologues were talking about Bitcoin replacing uh, various currencies around the world and becoming the global the global currency. And and one of the points that she made, and she's a uh, monetary economist. She said, well, look, Bitcoin is not going to replace the dollar. It's not going to replace the yen, not going to replace the pound. Um, it's not going to replace any of the reserve currencies. Uh, she said, however, that's only five. And and she says, there's hundreds of currencies around the world. And it is a threat to all those. Because if you're, if you live in, you know, Venezuela, Nigeria, you want a, you want a safe and secure store of value and something that the government can't uh, confiscate. And so I think that's, again, that's a, that's a, Again, huge potential uh, size. Interestingly enough, I'm going on probably more long-winded than you would like me to, but no, this I, is fascinating. I Bitcoin, so I keep going. Okay, okay. so I think it was just the other day that Bitcoin, uh, that the amount of the value of Bitcoin uh, equals the amount of Australian dollars in circulation. So it's already bypassed Australia in terms of the amount of current, the actual currency that's circulating. So it's about 270 billion, I think, of Australian. You know, coins and cash and currency floating around, and Bitcoin's about two hundred and what I say, eighty-five or ninety uh, mm-hmm. billion right now. So it's the seventeenth largest, if if you consider it a currency, it's the seventeenth largest in the world already, and that's quite remarkable for something that don't, didn't exist, you know, ten years ago. It is remarkable. It's someone that you know, Richard Silla, uh, who is a, a financial historian yeah. and. Uh, you know, formerly at the NYU Stern School of Business, a Hamilton scholar. Um, I talked to him the other day on a webcast for Wealth Track, and and he said it's it's a speculative bubble, and that this is you know typical of of what happens um, as markets are approaching tops. That something kind of comes out of nowhere, and uh, and you know, when, and I I'm thinking about you know you were quoted in the Wall Street Journal not too many weeks ago saying I think when Bitcoin then was trading at 6100, saying that you wouldn't buy it today at that level. I mean, what do you think about it now? No, what I what I said was I was not buying it. I'm not, I'm not sure how oh, they not quoted buying it. What it. I, what I, I said I said okay. I wasn't buying it now, but if I did not own it, 
I would buy it. I'd buy a 1% oh. position in it that day. And I would do the same okay. thing today. I think what, what's interesting to me about whether it be Dick's comments or I wrote a, I wrote a for the hedge fund, a shareholder letter on, on uh, Bitcoin at the end of September and we, we we changed it a little bit uh, and to make it a little more ecumenical, and it's on the website right now. And so I think if you, if you go to Miller Value Partners and yes, go to our website and look at look at look at the blog post that that I posted on Bitcoin. So what's what's interesting and what what I point out there, and I think this is maybe the salient point, is in the past since Bitcoin's had this uh, almost parabolic move in the past few months, in the third quarter you had a you had a quite remarkable number of people come out and dump on it, right? Jamie Dimon said it was. We call it a Ponzi scheme, or, or somebody called it a Ponzi mm-hmm. scheme. Jamie, Jamie said uh, he would fire anybody that did it. It was, you know, it, it was worthless. Buffett called it a mirage. Uh, Larry Fink said it was an index of money laundering. Paul Krugman said it was evil. You had all of these people coming out and dumping on Bitcoin, and I am highly confident to say that not one of them has actually studied it carefully. That is to say that they that they have strong opinions about something that they haven't really looked at. And which is brand new. And the thing that I find most telling and interesting about that is that so far, anyway, I have not found. Uh, and again, I, I try and read pretty widely on this on this uh, topic. I have not found a single venture capitalist of any repute who has dumped on Bitcoin. That is to say, the people that are exactly. dumping on it are people that that are that are unfamiliar with the technology. Don't, uh, as with Buffett, you know, claims not to know anything about technology, and yet yet they have a strong opinion about what is a brand new technology. And based on, uh, I'm not quite sure what. And I think it's interesting that that the people whose whose livelihood uh, depends on assessing new technologies, not only haven't dumped on it, that they've enthusiastically embraced it. So I, I think there's a big gap between the what uh, I, I think I think the great line from Mark Andreessen, uh, where he said when somebody asked Mark what he thought about Buffett calling uh, Bitcoin a mirage, he said. Um, this is almost an exact quote. He, he said, the record of old white men who don't understand technology, crapping on technologies they don't understand is 100%. And so I think that's the, uh, that, that, there's a big divide there, let's just say. I, I think also that, that people have, uh, in, in many cases, when they talk about, uh, I've heard several you know, prominent economists make comments, well, this isn't a, this isn't a currency because it, 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 uh, you know, it, it, it can't. It's, it, it's almost never used for transactions, and it would be stupid. Its volatility makes it such that it really can't be considered uh, a currency. And that that just to me is kind of, again, not thinking through things carefully. Because um, I don't know, was what, what was the German mark in 1923 a currency or wasn't it? Well, right. it, it it inflate it got it, it got inflated to zero, right? Um, but uh-huh. it was a currency. It was it was highly volatile. It just went down every right. single day. Same with the Venezuelan currency. So the fact that that that, that the that a currency can be highly highly volatile doesn't mean it can't function as a currency. It might mean that it's a very bad currency. But and and and, and it would be crazy to you know if for somebody in my opinion to transact in Bitcoin uh, with the uh, with the current price action in it because it could be or you, also you would never borrow Bitcoin with with its history of going from ten cents to seventeen thousand dollars because you'd be bankrupt. If you tried to pay it back, so there, there, there are things where I think the the, the idealization of it as uh, you know unit of account, store of value, et cetera, et cetera. Now all of that stuff is true. It just it just doesn't function well in any of those domains except so far as a store of value. Right. So a couple more questions, Bill. So you know to the the point made of you know that that you would buy it up to one percent of you know your liquid assets if you are individual or whatever. Well, in in your hedge fund MVP1, it's a lot more than one percent of its assets. I don't know where it is, just because the run-up has uh, been just, so phenomenal. It's just about fifty percent right now. Fifty percent right now. The, so what what do you do, yeah. uh, you know, as a portfolio manager with a in, you know an oversized position like that? I mean, have you ever had one asset class, or is it one asset in this case? Uh, at fifty percent of your any of your portfolios that you've run for investors and yourself, uh, we we actually had uh, we, no not 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 fifty percent, but we actually had at one point a twenty percent America Online. I think we had close to twenty in Dell and ten in Fannie Mae, but, so close to fifty so and maybe three names back in the back in the nineties. Okay. you know fifty percent of your hedge fund 
that's uh, a pretty oversized position by anyone's standards. So, you know, what do you do? Um, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a nice problem to have. We, we started out as a 5% position, and, and it's gone up so much. It's 50% of the, you know, of the hedge fund right now. And I think what we're, what we're studying are ways in which um, we can uh, mitigate the risk to the overall uh, fund and the portfolio while still allowing uh, the investors in the fund to have a choice about how they, wanna, how they want their, their, their particular uh, investment in Bitcoin handled. So we're, we're studying ways to do that right now, and I think we, we have a way, but we're not, not quite ready to disclose it. But, but it, it, I, I'd be fairly confident in saying that, that it won't be 50% of the fund uh, for that much longer, which does not mean necessarily that we're going to be selling it. So it's, there's, Got, there's, there's a, a path down. How to handle it. How to how to handle it? Yes, without without selling it. Yes. Gotcha. Oh, that's an inter- that is a, a very important point to make. How to handle it without selling it? Question about other cryptocurrencies. They're being you know minted daily. There's a whole kind of industry uh, you know in storage and uh, being you know built around Bitcoin and, and other cryptocurrencies. Uh, are are you contemplating yeah. or or are you investing in? Other cryptocurrencies as well, and and in the again the kind of the business that's that's surrounding um, these digital currencies. Um, in, the, in the short term, no. Uh, we we have Bitcoin Cash, which is a, a which is kind of like a, a dividend from Bitcoin, um, and that's you know that's also in the in the fund. But we haven't purchased anything other than other than Bitcoin for a variety of reasons. One of the one of the things that that um, has informed my thinking on this is the work of Brian Arthur, formerly of the uh, at Stanford and Santa Fe Institute, who who has done some of the uh, I'd say most creative work on the nature of technology. And he he is he identified uh, basically the, the point that Brian makes is that almost all technologies have a certain monopolistic aspect to them, uh, the ones that succeed, and so they reach a point of, of what he calls lock-in and path dependence. And that, that can take a while to reach that. It can take years to reach that. But once it once they do, then the market shares become highly stable and predictable. And so, for example, the you know, Microsoft's market share of operating systems, Intel's market share of, of uh, chips, that lock-in occurs when um, when the market share of the technology in question is over goes over 50% and stays there. And Bitcoin's market share. What's interesting about it is it it was over 90% maybe two years ago, and then Ethereum came along. And now all these other cryptocurrencies have come along. And at one point earlier in the year, Bitcoin's market share fell to around 30-some percent, 35 percent, I guess it was. And now it's risen back up to be uh, close to 70 percent. And so that, I think, is, is, is part of what the way we're thinking about this is that it's really not necessary to, to take a broad view of these, these new technologies unless one just wants to do that. Because if you're at a point of lock-in, then Bitcoin, if, if, if this stuff works, then Bitcoin will be the, the coin of choice, just like the... What, ha- what happened with VHS and Betamax, or with the QWERTY keyboard, for example? So I, I think that's uh, that's another thing to consider with with Bitcoin. Now I'm not ruling out that we would do that, but so far we haven't we haven't done anything with them. Most of those cryptocurrencies, by the way, if if monetary history is any guide, will be worthless. And uh, just as we had a period of free banking in the United States from the 1830s to the 1860s, and every bank could issue its own currency. And um, and virtually all of those became worthless, and um, as they should have, and and these ICOs are in, in many cases even even worse than that because that they are not one of the things that's, that's I think impeding the SEC in in uh, regulating these initial coin offerings, all these new cryptocurrencies, is that they don't these things do not allow you these ICOs they don't represent ownership in anything. So somebody who who actually raised a significant amount of money in an ICO said it was like making a contribution to the Salvation Army. You just you're doing it because you want to support the you know the effort that's underway. And so there's no there's no requirement that the people that you know issue these things that they do anything with them. They go out and buy boats or go on a vacation. So it's a I, th- I think it's a highly risky highly risky uh, space. But within that space, there are likely to be things that you know that work out well. My my, my son has been. Pitching me on on one that I won't mention, uh, which is going to come do an ICO in about a month, and he says it's the first one that he's looked at that um, he thinks is investable. So that's we'll see. How high risk is Bitcoin at these levels? Well, I, again, I I think that I would go back and just reiterate what 
Wentz has said in the sense of I wouldn't have any more money in Bitcoin than I was willing to lose 100% of. I think that the chances of it being ultimately worthless are far, far below what they were several years ago because you're building up an entire ecosystem uh, in the in, certainly in the venture space uh, where, where significant amounts of money are invested in in these kinds of in, in blockchain technologies of one sort or another and um, and I also think that there will be various uh, offshoots of of, of Bitcoin uh, some of these cryptocurrencies will probably turn out to be worth something but I, I would say you know maybe more realistically um, you know, look Bitcoin's gone down more than 50 percent uh, several times it when the Mt. Gox exchange was hacked, Bitcoin was $1,200 and it fell to $200. And then, of course, it, it, it rallied from there and, and it's up where it is right now. But I think right. that um, it, it's, it, you know, or, or look at the NASDAQ, for example. I mean, Amazon went down 95% from 1999 to 2002. Even if you bought it at the high, you still did really well if you held it since 1999. And so I think that's, you know, that's one of the things that some people speak about in the crypto assets community, especially with respect to Bitcoin, is, is they call themselves hodlers, but it's pronounced uh, holders, meaning um, you buy Bitcoin and you hold on for dear life. But if you try and trade it, you're likely to get traded. You're likely to trade, it, trade yourself right, um, right out of it. So I think that's, that's just, a, just some different random thoughts on it. Bill Miller, it's always a treat to talk to you. And it, this is a fascinating topic. And, uh, you know, congratulations on uh, how the your Bitcoin holdings have uh, appreciated so far. And, you know, we'll see what happens. But it's a, always a treat to have you. And I'll, I'll tell our audience that uh, you will be on uh, Wealth Track, the television program on public television, uh, in January. And we'll talk about, uh, see where Bitcoin is at that point, And we'll talk about a lot of other uh, investment topics as well. So thanks very much for joining us, Bill. Okay, great, Consuelo. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So this has been Bill Miller, Chairman and Chief Investment Officer of Miller Value Partners uh, and also a Portfolio Manager of the hedge fund MVP1, uh, which is a very sizable uh, owner of Bitcoin. Thanks so much for joining us and make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. Mm-hmm. 